to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in john 19 verse 30 the greatest statement of finality that has ever been made comes jesus said it is finished and he died and gave up his life that the whole world one day might have the opportunity to be saved we welcome you today to our study of John chapters 19 through 21. This is such a moving section in the Gospel of John as we're going to think about the suffering, the sacrifice, and the love of Christ exhibited in the death of Jesus. We hope you'll get your Bible and turn along with us as we study today from the last three chapters in the Gospel of John. We also want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ. Those members of the Lord's Church in your area, wherever you are, would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you'd like to have a Bible study or you've got questions about the church, they'd be happy to sit down and discuss those with you. I assure you, you'll find people who love God and love others at the Church of Christ. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God as well. Please visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a host of good Bible study material there. We have questions. We have uh, questions answered, Bible study uh, material. We have free DVDs and CDs of all our lessons, as well as digital downloads that you can access from the Internet. And friend, if you've got a question, or maybe something you've been struggling with spiritually, we'd be happy to try to help you answer that from the Word of God. You can email us or write to us or call us in any way we can help you in your study of the Word of God. We're concerned about souls and we want to help you with that. In John 19, we're now going to enter into the last few hours, last few moments of the life of Christ and it is a very graphic and dramatic picture of the extent of God's love and sacrifice to save humanity. John 19, Jesus has now been taken captive. He has been questioned by Pilate. He has been brought out before the people. And now in John 19, 5, here's a great statement that comes. Listen to these words. John 19, 5, Then Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. You know, I don't, there's several statements that Pilate makes that I'm just not sure he understood. And I don't know that he understood the import of what he said here. Look, behold the man. Jesus is the greatest man to be ever, ever behold. For when you think about his life, it's the epitome of perfection, is it not? This man lived a perfect life, didn't he? Hebrews 4 verse 15 says, And he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. 1 Peter 2 verse 22, He committed no sin, nor was guile or deceit found in his mouth. Jesus is the perfect man. Jesus is the man who did everything well. Mark 7 verse 47, as they thought about Jesus, the miracles He did, the healings, casting the demons out, they said He's done all things well. He makes both the blind to see and the deaf to hear, the mute to speak. Jesus is the man who did it all well. Jesus is the man who made that ultimate sacrifice. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, God made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. He's the ultimate man who made that sacrifice for each one of us. But friend, let's also realize, while Jesus was a man, He's more than just a man. John 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who is that Word? John 1 14 says, We beheld His glory as the glory of of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, more than just a man. He's also God, the Son of God. He is the Creator 
of all things. Colossians 1, verses 15 through 18. And so when I think about, you know, we think about great men. We think about people to, to look up to. Maybe your father. Maybe you've got somebody else in your life who's a great father figure or somebody that you look up to, a great icon. Friend, you can never find a greater man to follow than the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then mentioned in John 19, verse 11, we see kind of, uh, in a nutshell, the great scheme of God's redemption, His plan to save mankind. Look at John 19, verse 11. Jesus answers Pilate and says, You could have no power at all against me unless that had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. What do you want me to do with this Christ? Crucify Him, they say. And Jesus said, are you, Pilate said, Are you not going to answer me? Don't you know I've got power over you? And Jesus said, Hold on there, Pilate. Let's put a pause on that. You'd have no power at all if it hadn't been given to you from above. What do I learn from John 19, verse 11? The suffering, the agony, the trial, uh, the, the crucifixion of Christ, that was heaven's plan. Pilate was only a pawn. Judas a pawn as well. They had free will, now don't get me wrong. But it was ultimately God's plan being worked out. That's how much God loved me and you. 2 Timothy 1 verse 8, it was from before time. 1 Peter 1 verse 18, it was before the foundations of the world were ever laid. The church was God's eternal plan and Jesus purchased that with His own blood. Ephesians 3 verse 10 and 11. And so as I think about the events going on here, as I think about everything Jesus went through, this is heaven's plan. This is God's scheme of redemption to save mankind for all eternity. Now, Let's think in detail for just a moment about what Jesus did face and what He did suffer. I want you to think about, I want you to think about this in, in personal terms now. I want you to think about it in the words of 1 Peter 2.24. He Himself bore our sins in His own body that we might be healed. We were, he was chastised for our peace. The, it was upon us and for our sins, He was crucified. I want you to think about the hour of that, the, the unique personal nature of Christ's suffering. What did Christ go through? Well, the Lord, according to John 19, 1, was scourged. They took Jesus and they scourged Him. What does that mean? They took something like a whip. And at the end of that whip, Roman history records for us that on the very ends of that whip, it might have nail or, or metal or bone or some other sharp fragment like glass in the end of it embedded into it. And then they brought Jesus back, would be made tight. He would either be stretched from the ceiling or it would be uh, strapped over some type of post where every muscle and tendon in his back was nearly as tight as you could make it. And then that whip with the metal in the end of it will be brought over the back of Jesus again and again. Can you imagine how that must have hurt? Then according to John 19, 2, a crown of thorns was made and put on the head of Jesus. When you think about thorns, we're talking about these long thorns that sometimes you find on, on these long bushes out in the country. And uh, Jesus, a crown of thorns was made and then that was placed on the head of Jesus. I doubt they placed it real gently as those crowns pierced His brow. A purple robe was put on the back of Jesus. Now you remember that back that is bloody and that is mauled from having that scourging, that robe adheres to that blood and it dries and then they rip it off again. They hit Jesus with the hand. They spit in the face of the Savior. The robe is taken off and all the pain of the scourging starts again. They, they mocked Jesus. They bowed the knee. They said, Hail King of the Jews. They mocked the Savior. And then Jesus' hands and His feet are nailed to a cross. That cross is put in the ground and Jesus hangs there in agony until He dies. Now you think about this. If your hands and your feet were nailed to a cross, for every breath that you inhaled, you'd have to put pressure on the nail in your feet. For every breath that you exhaled, as you let that breath out, the pressure would be on your hands. Every breath Jesus inhaled and exhaled brought pain and agony beyond measure. Well, why did He do all that? Brings new meaning to the words of John 3, 16, doesn't it? God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Why did Jesus face all that? Why did He go through that? He tasted death for every man. 
Hebrews 2 verse 9. He's the propitiation for our sins, not for ours alone, for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 2 verse 1 and 2. Christ did that because that's, He didn't want me to suffer and to die for my sin. He didn't want you to have to suffer and to die for your sin. He stood in our place and took the punishment we deserved for sin. I want you to look at this great scene in John 19, beginning in verse 30 through 34. Look at these words, John 19, verse 30. The Scripture records, So when Jesus had received the sour wine, He said, It is finished. And bowing His head, He gave up the Spirit. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. You know, when you think about the events of the cross and them coming to Jesus, He's already dead. They've got a check. They pierce that side of His, and blood and water comes out. The blood and water both collect around the heart after death, and, and blood and water came out. Jesus had already given up His life. Zechariah 13 verse 1 says it this way, I can't help but think of Zechariah 13 1 when I think of that blood and water coming forth from the body of Jesus. It says this, a fount was opened for cleansing and for sin in Jerusalem. Friend, how true that is about Jesus. That fountain that poured forth blood and water was open that day for the sins of all the world. And anyone who will obey the gospel can take part in that. Blood and water have always been significant in God's plan of salvation. The blood is the sacrifice of Jesus, the water representative of the cleansing that occurs. Friend, do we see the connection? in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 2, Peter preached, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Here was the answer. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. There's the blood of Jesus that was offered for sin. There are people being baptized in water for the remission of their sins. Blood and water came forth, and they've always been essential in God's plan of salvation. Now, let's think about the good news, though, from this text. We've seen the gruesome nature of it. We've seen the death of Jesus and, and what that brought about. My friend, I also want you to see that the grave could not contain the Lord and Savior. Look in your Bible in John chapter 20, verses 19 and 20. I want you to look beginning in verse number 19. What happened after Jesus' death? The Bible says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When He said this, He showed them His hands and His side. When, then the disciples who were, were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. What do we know about Jesus here? Death didn't contain him. At the death of Christ and at his resurrection, he overcame death. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55 through 57. You remember what Jesus said at the death of his friend Lazarus, right? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, he'll never really die. And Jesus promised earlier in the Gospel of John, all are in the graves will one day come forth. Lord, show me that's true. Here I am, having overcome death. You can be sure it's true. Jesus defeated Satan. He, he dealt the death blow to sin so that men would never have to succumb to its consequences. And He reigned victoriously over both by rising out of the grave and ultimately going to ascend to the right hand of the Father. Friend, this is the good news for each and every one of us. We don't have to remain in the grave. Now you think about this. Death, uh, the sacrifice, sin, being a Christian, what does all of that mean without the resurrection? Unless there's hope for tomorrow, after this life, what does all of that mean? 
My friend, the resurrection is key to it all. Yes, I've been forgiven of sin. Yes, I'm a child of God. And the good news is the grave will not contain you. You will rise out of that and one day live with God forever. Now, in this context, we see that some of Jesus' disciples even need a little convincing themselves. Look in John chapter 20, and I want you to notice verse number 26 following. And after eight days, His disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then He said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. You see, Thomas had been told by the other disciples, The Lord's risen. Well, Thomas wasn't there when Jesus came back the first time. We don't know where he was, but he wasn't there. And so he said, I believe it when I see it in essence. And Jesus says, Thomas, put your fingers here. Reach your fingers into my side. And Thomas said, I don't need to do that. My Lord, my God, I believe. He saw the evidence. He was convic convicted of the resurrection of Jesus. And friend, that resurrection in the Scriptures convict us as well of the power of Christ as God and of the power of the resurrection. Now, the Gospel of John, kind of concluding with the resurrection. There'll be one more chapter, but kind of concluding the, the scheme of redemption with the resurrection. John brings his whole point to a climax. What's John all about? Look in John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you might have life in His name. What's John written about? Why, why John write the Gospel of John? Why did the Holy Spirit give us this book? These things are written. Why? That you may believe, to be convicted that Jesus is the Messiah and that by believing and trusting in Him, we could have eternal life in His name. John uniquely picks out seven miracles, seven witnesses, seven great I Am statements. He, he emphasizes the fulfillment of prophecy and the great sacrifice of Jesus. To, why do all that? To convict our hearts that Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Savior of the world. And by following Him and trusting Him, we can have the hope of eternal life. Now, there's one more chapter in the Gospel of John. And this is a great chapter of, of restoration. And here's what we mean by that. Peter played a, a rather important role in the trial, betrayal, and crucifixion of our Lord. You know as well as I do that it was Judas who betrayed the Savior when they offered him those 30 pieces of silver, when the rooster, or when, the, when they offered him those 30 pieces of silver, and he kissed Jesus and identified him, he was the ultimate betrayer. But do we also remember that Peter denied the Lord as well? You remember especially in Matthew's account, Matthew 26 and 27, Jesus tells His disciples, all of you will be scattered tonight because you're followers of Me. And Peter said, Lord, I don't care if everybody else is scattered. I'm not going anywhere. And Jesus looks Peter in the eye and He says, Peter, before the rooster crows, you'll deny Me three times. And Peter did exactly that. You remember they said as Peter is standing there warming himself by the fire, aren't you one of his? No, not me. Well, weren't you with him? Uh -uh. And the last time when they questioned Peter, you're one of his disciples. Truly, your speech betrays you. The book of Matthew tells us he began to curse and to swear. I don't even know the man. And then he heard that echo of that rooster as it crowed. And he remembered the words of Jesus. And he went out and wept bitterly. How did Peter deal with that? He had been following Jesus for nearly three years. He had made a real commitment to the teaching and the life of Jesus. And in a, in a moment of crisis, Peter denied that he even knew Jesus. And Jesus dies and he doesn't get to make that right? How did, Jesus, how did Peter live with himself? How did he correct that? How did he make it right? How did he go on? to be the great man that he was and write two great epistles even later. He must have forgiven himself and he must have known that Jesus forgave him. Well, he absolutely did. 
And a big part of John chapter 21 is about that. Look in John chapter 21, beginning in verse number 15. Jesus is now having breakfast with His disciples after the resurrection, and the Bible records this. So when they'd eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to them, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. Then he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus is asking Peter, do you, do you have affection for me? Do you really love me? Do you have that sacrificial type of love? Yes, Lord. And three times after denying the Lord, he now has an opportunity to affirm three times his love for Jesus. And the affirmation of that is not just in Peter's statement, yes, Lord, you know I love you. It's in what Jesus expected Peter to do. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, prove your love by your actions. And as Peter lived out his life in faithfulness to the Lord, as he went and spread the gospel, as he lived a life of dedication, as history records that he even would give up his life for the cause of Christ, Peter was restored, not just by saying those words, you know I love you, but by the lifestyle that he lived. You say, okay, that's all good and well, but what? Here's the application. All of us have probably at one time or another stood in the shoes of Peter, been put in a difficult place, maybe by self, maybe by sin, maybe by others, and we didn't do what we should have done. We didn't say what we should have said. We didn't live the way we should have lived. We didn't stand up for Jesus like we should have stood up for Him. And In essence, we've probably all betrayed Him as well in some sense or another. Can you get over that? Can you get back where you need to be? Can you be a faithful follower of Christ? Sure, how? Prove your love for the Lord by making it right and living for Him, living for Him, committing to His cause, and being a servant of Christ's people each and every day. That's what it really means to prove your love to the Lord and Savior. And so there's no doubt that Peter loved Jesus. There's no doubt that he gave in during a moment of weakness, but his life proves his commitment to the Lord and Savior. We've all made mistakes and done things that we shouldn't have done. You can get over that. You can be forgiven. You can be right with God. But each of us needs to live a life of service and sacrifice to God like Peter did the rest of the days of our lives. Now, one other lesson from John chapter 20, and it's found in verse number 25. John wants to leave us with this impression. He says, I've given you the evidence. I've shown you the, by, by these examples that you can know Jesus is the Christ. But here's what I also want you to know. What we've shown doesn't even begin to touch the hem of the garment of all that Jesus said and did. There could have been much more, but this suffices. Look in John chapter 21, verse number 25. The book of John closes by saying, And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. You know, that leaves us with a lot to wonder and think about. I know just from what I've read in the Bible, the good Jesus did. That doesn't even touch the hem of the garment of all the good that He did. Friend, as you think about the Gospel of John, the message John leaves us with is that, that God loved me and you so much that He sent His Son to die for the world. The message that we find in the book of John is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That if I will follow Him, I can have the hope of overcoming death and sin, and I can one day partake in the resurrection. But to do that, I've got to be a follower of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Nicodemus came to Jesus. Teacher, we know that you're a man sent from God. Nobody can do the things you do unless God's with him. Jesus got right to the heart of the matter and said, Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he can't get into my kingdom. 
Nicodemus said, Lord, what do you mean? How can, I be born? How can a man be born when he's old? You want him to go a second time into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus clarified by saying, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Friend, we want to encourage you today to put your faith in Christ, to become a Christian, to have the hope of eternal life by obedience to the gospel. As Jesus said, you've got to be born of water and the Spirit. You've got to hear the Word of God to be saved. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10 verse 17. Having heard the message that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, you've got to make a commitment to that. In Acts chapter 8, as Philip is teaching the Ethiopian unit the gospel, they come to a certain water, the Bible says, and the eunuch says, here's water, what did it hinder me? If you believe with all your heart, you may. Friend, to be saved, not only do you have to hear the message of salvation, you've got to believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You've got to repent and turn from sin. Stop doing wrong. Make up your mind, I'm going to try to live for Jesus every day. I'm going to stop doing wrong. I'm going to turn from sin. Luke chapter 13, verse number 3. You've got to confess Jesus as your Lord. With the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10 verse 10. And friend, you must be born of water to be a child of God. Saul was told in Acts chapter 9, by Jesus, he was told, you go into the city, it'll be told you what you must do. God sends a man by the name of Ananias to Saul, and here's what Saul tells, or what Ananias tells Saul he must do. Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Peter said in 1 Peter 3, 21, Baptism does now also save us. And then, once I obey the gospel, I've got to be faithful until death. Revelation 2, verse 10. I must walk in newness of life, trying to live a good life and be a light to the world every day of my life for my Lord and my Savior. And so John says... Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Savior of the world. Here's the evidence. We beg you to believe it. If you're not a Christian, we beg you to obey the gospel today and be faithful until death. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.